Hi everyone, Keenan here. I just wanted to make a plug for Anchor, the platform that I use to make this podcast. It's free, it's super easy to create, and anybody can, you know, add anything. You can have background music, songs, sounds, as you know that I have in my one. I, I listen to some that with like super silly sounds from my friends too. Um, they'll distribute it to everybody too. I have most of my listeners are Spotify or Apple, but they go all over the place. It's really great. It has everything you need. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello and welcome to For Whom the Cell Tolls. My name is Keenan, and I sadly just woke up my partner slash mascot, Scout, the Pomeranian. So she's staring me down right now. So I'll let you know if I have to um, make sure that she's okay. So today's episode is about CRISPR-Cas9, which is essentially a technology that we can use to change DNA. We've never had access to a technology like this, and it really is a step, you know, whether you call it forward, backward, to the side, it's a step in evolution and our species that's fairly unprecedented. Because although, remember I brought this up before, most animals adapt to their environment. We, as humans, adapt the environment to us. CRISPR gives us another tool that can kind of defy the laws of nature, essentially, in that even with all of our genetic success, all this, you know, our species success, let's call it, we've never been able to change what DNA you get. You get one set of chromosomes from mom, one from dad, and that's it. And the genes that they give you are set in stone. Now, like I've said, DNA isn't the whole story. The age of pure DNA being the whole story is probably coming to a close pretty quick. I mean, we just have so many more factors to, to look at now as, as scientists. But CRISPR gives us something new. With CRISPR, you can change the genetic code of something which means that if the DNA code is changed in a specific gene, the RNA, the single strand, will get changed, and that will code for a changed protein. And that changed protein could have a myriad of different functions. Who knows? So one of the things that this has led to is an ethical dilemma. And only a month ago, this is, I think, December 2018, a Chinese scientist supposedly used CRISPR to manipulate the DNA of embryos of a pair of twins. And the manipulation that he supposedly made was a resistance mechanism to the HIV virus. So there are populations of people out there that have an inherently greater resistance to HIV because of this mutation, and he induced it. He essentially knocked out one of the genes that HIV needs to get into our T cells. So what, what we have to make of this is that there are so little true rules and regulations. And the other, the second thing, is that CRISPR is very easy to get your hands on. It's very easy to use. I've used it in lab myself. Remember, so when we have those cancer cell lines in the little flask, we can take those cells and use CRISPR on them, direct it to make changes in the DNA. And we can use using those changes in the DNA, we can study certain cell mutations that you know, we don't have to use in mice, for example. So this way we can test certain therapies against the mutants, things like that. The way CRISPR-Cas9 works, it's essentially just a harnessed bacterial defense mechanism against viruses. It's a big enzyme, which is essentially just a big protein gene that is able to like kind of chop things up or change things. And what it does is that it takes up a guide RNA. So remember that's the single strand. And so this guide RNA has a code on it and it follows that code to DNA that matches that RNA, and then it chops up that DNA. Just that specific part though, just what the RNA is guiding it to. This is a defense mechanism against viruses. And remember how bacteria and viruses were super, um, they've always had this big war against one another. And that's, this, this is just one of the arms race things that popped in, and it's specific to viral RNA. So like in Cas9 and CRISPR, in the bacteria in the normal setting, it just has a viral like looking like RNA in it and then it uses that to guide it to the bad viruses that come in and it chops them up and that's it. So we were able to harness this technology and essentially we have now, we now have a tool in our hands that as I'll get into in this episode a little bit, it is a Pandora's box. And the one thing that I'll address at the end and I'll say it now, we've already opened it. There really is no going back with something like this. This is very, like I said, 
it's affordable, it's everywhere, it's, and it's very easy to master. I wouldn't say very easy to master, it's not like you can do this in your garage, but a capable set of labs, anything's possible. Like I said, I've used this in research before. So I'm going to start at the beginning of where a lot of these debates are starting, and that is in the medical field with genetic diseases. So I'll just start with a generic story. So imagine being born with the dominant Huntington's genes allele, Huntington's disease, sorry. It's a neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease that essentially if you have that bad gene, your, uh, your neurons essentially just start to fail around middle age. And it's terrifying, it's shocking, it's one of the scariest things out there. And, you know, I know, like I say in this, in a lot of these episodes, we're all on borrowed time. Essentially, we don't have a clock on us. It's still terrifying to know when your time may come, you know, and the fact that it is going to be cut short. We really don't have a cure for this disease. When it happens, it happens. And the loss of brain cells is quick and it's just, it's terrible. So imagine the scenario of a 25 year old married couple, let's say, and the woman is consulting with a doctor and they're going to try and get pregnant. You know, this is, everything's pretty standard and they perform a fairly large genetic, genetic test for any predisposing variants. Now, what they find is that the woman has the Huntington's gene, uh, uh, the Huntington's disease allele, which means that around middle age, she will start to suffer the disease. Now, as shocking and terrible as this news is in this story, let's imagine that the couple decides that yes, for as long as I can be around, we should still have a child. And for the purposes of this thought experiment, let's imagine that screening against a donor egg, or against a fertilized egg and disposing of that egg is not on the table as it is in the European Union a lot of days now. So remember that, that in the European Union, a lot of other places, they do do genetic screens for stuff like this or other things, trisomy 21, things like that. And oftentimes that embryo is basically canceled. So that's something to acknowledge here that in this scenario, that's not happening. So let's say the pregnancy takes, but the couple is pretty immediately confronted with the fact that this embryo is Huntington's positive. The mother did pass on her gene. It was a 50-50 chance. So under these circumstances, what should the couple do if confronted with the choice that CRISPR-Cas9 could come in, manipulate the embryo gene, cancel out the Huntington's disease, and everybody walks away fine? So I think something that struck me when I was thinking of this, how to craft this, is just how difficult this would be in the clinic. Doctors took an oath to do anything for their patients to preserve, you know, to prevent human death and disease and everything. It's their logical obligation to protect, you know, protect anything they can. So under that logic, if CRISPR-Cas9 was available to cancel out this mutant, let's say this was the only option, to, the way to do it. Otherwise, you're birthing a child that truly has i don't i don't ever want to say yeah i don't i don't know it's a bad disease let's say that we do not want this and then you're going to give birth to that child is that fair number 1 to that child is it not more is are you not obligated to pursue an option like crispr cas9 right to change the genes in the dna and save the child so I'd invite you to think on that. It's not an easy idea because things get a little complicated. Now, on one hand, this is essentially the rebirth of the polio vaccine. All of a sudden, we can go in and chop up all these bad mutations and fix them. No child someday, and I imagine this will come true, no child someday will eventually die of cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, all kinds of other genetic defects that can be fixed with single spot uh, mutation fixes with CRISPR-Cas9. The elimination of inherited traits and the elimination of being a genetic carrier for some of these traits, it's a powerful possibility. It, like, it really is. The fact that you could have some of these things gone forever 
it would just be, I mean, it would be amazing. It'd be this next step, like I talked about, and that's what CRISPR could represent is this true next step. So on the other hand, this is where things will probably start becoming an issue. Let's say that, cool, they have the option of doing CRISPR. Everything's going to be fine. They're actually, you know, the medical community will ultimately in the long run save also a lot of money by getting rid of all these genetic defects in children that later grow into adults that don't need treatment anymore. Here's the issue though. Would you, so imagine I asked my class this, would you give the CRISPR-Cas9 to the child, the embryo now, given that, you know, you could save it from Huntington's? Most everybody raises their hand, pretty much everybody. Now, would you still do it? If it costs a million dollars and no insurance pays for it, you pay for it. And only people that can afford a million dollars to do this procedure can afford it. And that's when a lot of the hands start going down. Who has the right to save? Does everybody have the right to this kind of screening, to these, to these huge tests? Now, I imagine the cost of something like this, as anything that is in high demand, will go down. As time to, as time goes, but for for our purposes right now, CRISPR would be something that would probably be there only for special situations where there is a lot of capital and money available, and is that thus a fair thing? So that's really something to kind of think about, chew on, because that's where kind of the medical ethics. That's that first story. That's your intro to what medical ethics and CRISPR could be in the future. So it's something you should definitely think about because it's not going to be a long time before this will be something we all, we all have to really address up front, all in our faces. So the second part of the talk still relates to, and I don't want to, sorry, not a talk. I'm not teaching anybody. The second part of this, this uh, today's episode is about kind of the next step after medical interventions and applications in the laboratory, in the clinic for CRISPR. Does it end there? And the theme, like I said, this is a box that cannot be shut. Once you, you know, once we bring in the, the most pure altruistic, you know, thought, the most pure altruistic feat is that of saving children from disease, right? You can't, you know, you can't, Mention, you can't even come up with anything that's like, well, you can probably, but you can't come up with many things that are better, morally, more objectively a good thing than saving children. So by that logic, we have to move forward with CRISPR. We have to make it accessible. Everybody needs it. And that would be amazing. And it probably will be like this someday. I'm, I'm not, I don't doubt that. Now, I want to take you back to last episode. We talked about atomic weapons, creators versus created. And what Oppenheimer said, essentially, that we had become death. We have created something that could end us. Our creation could destroy us. CRISPR is, has to be part of that conversation now. It has to be in the conversation of a Cold War deterrent, an amazing technology. It has to be in the same conversation as an atomic weapon. And by amazing, I don't mean good. I mean more like infamous. With CRISPR out of the box, you have the potential to use it for very bad things. For example, there are strains of flu virus that are hyper deadly and hyper infective. And like we talked about before, there are also two samples of smallpox left in the world. So keep that in mind too, but we'll stay with flu. So in 1918, there was a Spanish flu epidemic. It almost killed three and a half or no, like three to 5% of the world's population. Now, given this was in 1918 and this was right during world war one. So it made sense that everybody got it when they were all fighting in the trenches, no medicine, stuff like that. And then they all went back home and everything still, you know, everything was really terrible. This was a bad disease. The flu virus, how it does its genomes, it can switch around. It goes in between different hosts, chickens, pigs, us, and those genes change. And that's why you always have a flu virus or a flu vaccine is because it has to be different because the little pathogens are going to be different every time. So the Spanish flu was called H5N1. It was infective and it was deadly. We've had deadly flus before. 
in our lifetime. We've had infective flus before in our lifetime. We have never had a deadly and infective one in our lifetime. This is the premise of the movie Contagion, and it does a very good job of showing how you would respond to something like that. So now take what I've told you and apply it across the episode. I've told you that CRISPR is easy. I've told you that it's accessible. It can be done in any lab for the most part. I've also told you that morally, in the future, we likely will be obligated to use it, you know, just by pure logic. And that the other thing is that it's already out of the box. There's no going back now. This box is completely open. People have the ways to do it. There's no way to restrict it, for example. There's no way to say you can only do CRISPR for good things when, like I said, it's out of that box. You can use CRISPR for bad things. Now let's go into another story. And this is kind of the opposite side of the coin from the medical side. If you were to take a CRISPR kit and bring it into a lab of a country that wanted atomic weapons, but could not have them, it was restricted, it was not going to work. Nobody, I'm not pointing fingers here, let's just, this is just a hypothetical. So you bring in an already deadly strain of flu virus. Let's say you can put it in, put it in through a few animal models. You get a pretty, pretty bad mix. What you can use CRISPR for is changing the genetic makeup of the flu virus to become something completely new. If you make the if you make specific changes in the genome, you'll change what proteins and its mechanisms of action. And if you have a skilled virologist there, you'll know exactly what you're doing. You're making it more infective. You're making it more deadly. You're making it undetectable to the immune system. These changes in DNA that CRISPR can grant us can be applied to something like this. And why I brought up the comparison between atomic weapons is because that is essentially that's closing in on what we're going to deal with. And the advantage that a weapon of mass destruction based on a disease manipulated by CRISPR has is that there's no launch, there's no explosion, there's just release into the world, into this globally connected world. Now, say that some state that was mad it didn't have nukes and now it has its own deterrent and now it can start making demands. God forbid they release this disease that has no vaccine to it. We have no idea what the genetic code looks like. It's ever hypermutating or something like that. The tools to make something like this exist now. Maybe maybe it's pretty far on the horizon still for, you know, because I'm not a pure virologist. I do know that, you know, with what we have in our hands now, it is an idea that is a possible thing. And that's what's scary, is essentially you could engineer a virus in your own lab you could make your own vaccine for it for your own people and then say, if you come in within our borders, let's say, we'll release this and millions of people will die. But you can't prove that, you know, even if it was us, maybe they wouldn't say that we're going to release it then, but still, they would like leak it or something. Anyway, the important thing is that it becomes a deterrent. Even the thought that, even, the, even just saying, we have this in the lab, don't make us release it, you know, we don't want to do it, but you have to give us, you know, this territory or this amount of money or something. So now it comes the logical side of the debate. Well, God, like if they have atomic weapons, we need our own atomic weapons. It's the idea of a pure deterrent. So it's not to ever be used, but it's the idea that in this logical scenario, in this kind of prisoner's dilemma, it's in the interest of everyone then to make their own kind of super disease that they can say, no, if you release yours, I'll release mine. And that is, personally, I think that's the sad reality that this this may head to, and that would be on the horizon. I don't know. Like, obviously, that's a little scary, and obviously, I think this maybe is years on the horizon. It's just, all the tools are there. And although CRISPR, like I've said, has all these altruistic and scientific applications that we can use and make the world an amazing better place and save lives the technology is a technology and it can be used very easily for a mere like a ton of different stuff and so when you hear about CRISPR from now on sorry we got interrupted at the end there by a call um so what I was saying is that essentially we're at this you know anytime you encounter CRISPR you see it in the news you see all this stuff remember that this technology is accessible it's easy to use, so we all have to start thinking about 
what we have to do to use it responsibly. And we, you know, we're going to have to have that conversation. Essentially, if you want my own personal ideas, I think that the box is open. I think that whatever good or dangerous things will come out of that box, I think we're just going to, we're going to have to deal with them as they come because there's no way to put this back in its box. Anyway, thank you very much again for listening and Scout and I will see you next episode. This is episode 10, so I'll probably call this a season and maybe pick up after the holidays after we get a little less busy. But otherwise, thanks again and super it's been super fun to record these episodes and I hope you enjoyed a few of them. I have a bunch planned for next um and I will get that email set up. Sorry, I keep forgetting. And you can like submit questions, things like that. All right, awesome. Have a good night and thanks again for listening. Bye.